What's up everybody? Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, I did because it was my birthday yesterday um, and I was utterly spoilt by wife and children so I had a really nice day so uh, that was cool. Uh, no Grand Prix of course, in fact no motorsport on my radar so it was a weekend off in that sense which was really really nice. Uh, so I hope yours was good as well but my radar covers Formula One and Formula E there were none of those two things. But without even without those, there's still loads of really good questions. Quite a random mix of questions this week, so we're gonna try and rattle through as many as I can. Welcome to another Ask Elvis. Right, we're gonna start uh, with a question just referencing the Russian Grand Prix, and then we're gonna move forward. So this one comes from Nicholas Wiseman, who says, could the reason that Vettel was faster in Russia or on Russia race day be it was because he was using too much of the hybrid power which eventually led to the failure of the MG UK? Are these decisions uh, of engine modes left up to the driver even to the point of vehicle failure? The reason I brought this question up, it's not that, so the, the, quickly the answer is that I don't think it was anything to do with how Sebastian was using the hybrid part of the power unit. As I explained, I think, in last week's video, I suspect it was much more related to heat, uh, heat soak following the pit stop, perhaps. Um, but the second part of the question, are these decisions of engine modes left up to the driver to the point of vehicle failure? No, they're not. Um, and that might seem like an obvious thing, but lots of people say to me, you know, when you hear people like Charles saying, right, I need you to give me everything I've got. People often say to me, well, why doesn't he just turn the switch on the steering wheel to give him everything he's got? Why doesn't he just do that? The main reason for that is that first of all it has to be a team decision because they have a lot more information to hand than the driver does but also those switches on his steering wheel don't always just do the same things. It's not always that the button down here is turning it to number two will give you a set power mode. It doesn't work like that. The teams are able to configure those switch positions for whatever they want and they can be different depending on the, the race strategy, depending on the race circuit, the environment, all sorts of things can be completely configurable. So the driver turning a switch position to switch position two won't necessarily give him exactly the same thing that position number two gave him three races ago. So that's why the drivers can't be in total control of those things as it currently stands. And that's why the decision has to very much be led by the team. Right, next one comes from Robert Rowles. Now, Robert sent me an email, so thank you very much, Robert. He says, hello, Mark. Uh, now that McLaren were using uh, Mercedes power units in 2021, will Renault go it alone? Will Mercedes then dump Williams and are customer teams a help or a hindrance to the manufacturers? So, uh, will Renault go it alone? I mean, it kind of looks like they will at this stage. We could see some uh, change to that, but at the moment, it might look like Renault will be just looking after their own team. Um, will Mercedes dump Williams? No, because Williams have already just signed, in fact, just recently signed a long-term agreement with Mercedes, I think through till 2024 from memory. So Williams and McLaren absolutely locked into that Mercedes contract. The one that we don't yet know about, but we would assume would continue, would be the Racing Point uh, tie-up. Currently using Merck engines, but uh, as yet, I don't think any announcement or any decision on whether they will continue longer term with Mercedes, or perhaps could they go and switch over to Renault, something like that. There's lots of permutations that could happen, but Williams, I think, are staying with Mer Mercedes for a long time. And uh, the last part, is a customer team a help or a hindrance to a manufacturer? Well, it's a help. First of all, it does bring in some uh, financial uh, income, of course, because they're selling their services and their products, so there's, there's that side of it. But also, and far more importantly, it provides another set of data on those power units. If you've got six cars running around with your power unit, as opposed to just your own two cars, you get loads more data coming in every race weekend, and that data can be used for reliability and performance gains, and it's just an absolute benefit, and almost a must, if you're gonna be uh, at the top of your game. It's why Honda struggled to develop so much when they were just with McLaren. Uh, now, of course, with Red Bull, they have you know two teams operating, so they're able to, to gather more data and pursue the, the chosen development path much quicker when you've got more cars on circuit using your systems. Uh, now, Robert also sent me a second email, so I have given him a second question this week. It's a quick one, but lots of people ask this. Uh, hi, Mark, uh, during the post-race driver interviews, there's always a team representative there 
um, next to the driver who's also recording the exchange. What's their purpose? I think I may have touched on this once before, but you, you know what he's talking about, the guy or the girl with the dictaphone in the back of every shot, aren't they? Almost as famous as the drivers because they're always there. Um, the reason they're recording that themselves First of all is because they then have a record of what the driver has said. So if there's any dispute, if somebody misquotes somebody, they're able to go back and check that recording. But also they use those quotes that the driver has given in those interviews to then regurgitate and produce their own press releases uh, later on that same day. So the team use that information um, to, to churn out their own press releases that they distribute uh, to the media as well. Uh, and saves them having to sit down with the driver and ask all the same questions that they've already been asked 20 times uh, already in the media pen. Um, now, Olen, oh, sorry if I get this name wrong. <laughs> Hold on, I can't see, it's a bit small. Uh, Olen Dugeng Petter. Olebegeng Petter. Apologies if I got that wrong. Uh, hi Mark, could you kindly explain the part uh, where the car is considered as live? Isn't carbon fibre more of an insulator than it is an electrical conductor? Now this is referring to uh, Sebastian Vettel of course in Russia where his car failed and he had to leap off the side of the car. If you remember he stood right on top of the chassis and leapt clear. That's because the car was electrically unsafe. Um, carbon fibre is, an, is a conductor of electricity. Uh, it's not the best conductor of electricity, but the voltages are so high, and at certain parts of the car as well, there's, uh, there are uh, metallic elements laid up within that as well, within the carbon fiber. Um, there are different resins and all sorts of different components to a carbon fiber layup, uh, certainly across a Formula One car, that mean that it does conduct electricity. And if we have a, sit a situation in Russia like where Sebastian's car had this MGUK failure which meant that the insulation broke down somewhere within that part of the hybrid system. What happens is on the top of the chassis you get that red light to say that the car is unsafe. Sebastian gets that as well on the steering wheel. The team obviously knew that as well and that's in incidentally why they stopped him um, because potentially it was unsafe. It's not unsafe while the driver's in the car because he's just sitting uh, you know, within that structure but if he were to climb out of the car in the normal way touching the chassis and then touching the floor he would then be earthed and that could then potentially cause a, a serious problem. So yes, the answer to your question is um, carbon fibre is a conductor. It can be an insulator at times as well, but it is a conductor of electricity uh, in this sense. And therefore uh, it can, if, this, if the insulation breaks down somewhere within that system, it can mean that the chassis can go live. That's why they have those lights, that very safe and secure system on board every Formula One car. Same thing on a Formula E car, of course. Um, that's why the marshals all have those big rubber gloves um, because they all can see this big red light. They're all aware if there's a problem. And normally what happens is the team are able to remotely shut that down, remotely deal with it um, before anyone's able to touch it. And that's what happened during the race. They uh, obviously, they neutralized the race much to Ferrari's uh, detriment in the end, but they neutralized the race uh, whilst they safely uh, secured the car and then they actually left the car there until the end of the Grand Prix when the team were able to get to it and then deal with it in a safe and controlled manner. Um, Oliver Ferres says, what makes an F1 track high tire wear? Does lots of 90 degree corners like in Sochi always mean low tire wear? Uh, not necessarily. So there are a number of factors. Um, yes, of course, the type of corner, the frequency of the corners, the, the, the speeds that these corners are taken at, but also the track surface. And, and actually, when you're talking about Sochi, one of the biggest reasons that it's low tyre wear in Sochi is that the racetrack surface is incredibly smooth. Uh, it's just very smooth tarmac. Some circuits are much more abrasive, where the surface is, is rough, you get the little I talk about this on a macro level. If you zoomed in in a microscope at the top of a racetrack, you see the little pieces of aggregate sticking up above the, the actual the tarmac. And that is what means that the surface is rough, it's abrasive, it wears through tyres very quickly. Well, Sochi just doesn't have that. It's very, very smooth. Gradually over time, that wears away, leaving the aggregate exposed, and it does become more abrasive. But right now, Sochi's still young enough as a circuit to be very, very low wear. Yeah, of course, the circuit configuration also plays a part, and it's generally about the amount of energy that you're putting through the tires. So for example, there can be circuits where it's all very stop-start, 
really heavy on the brakes and then all about traction out of things like really low speed corners onto a long straight where you're putting loads of energy through the rear tyres and quite often you can break traction and that will obviously increase rear just, uh, wear just on the rear tyres. And similarly if you've got lots of high speed, high energy corners going in one direction you can really put an awful lot of wear and tear through the, the outside tyres uh, on that particular circuit. So lots of reasons why a circuit might be high or low wear and degradation but in Sochi it's very much to do with the nature of the tarmac itself and how smooth it is. Uh, Brandon Dorr says, do you think the 2021 regulations will be good enough to attract new works teams like a BMW or Porsche as well as proposed customer teams like Panthera? Um, well, we now know the answer to this, don't we? In that there was a statement this week, uh, week just gone from Formula One itself saying that there are no um, major or serious contenders for a new entry in 2021 and actually that Formula One aren't really looking for a new entry until at least 2022 once they've had time to settle in these regulations allow them to, to bed in and settle themselves down such a massive change to the sport it feels like a sensible move but actually more to the point the reason we haven't got a BMW or a Porsche because they've all looked at this when we talked about new regulations for 2021 what a couple of years ago they all looked at that we were talk about new different types of, of power units that might attract new engine manufacturers and new teams and in the end they've all assessed what looks like going to be happening in 2021 and decided actually there's not enough change to make it a viable proposition it's still too expensive you know the engines are till, still too expensive why would you come in now with a very similar engine to the one we have now with already four engine manufacturers with a huge amount of experience already in that game, why would you come in, spend probably hundreds of millions when you're at a massive disadvantage to those competitors all around you? So if we'd had a dramatic change to the engines, for example, where they became much more, much cheaper, that might have been a real sign that other teams might have looked at it and gone, do you know what, might be a time to have a crack at Formula One. But as it stands, certainly don't think we're going to get a BMW or a Porsche anywhere in the near future and as for proposed customer teams or independent teams maybe but not in 2021 by the looks of it. David Stanley how are the three sectors determined on a racetrack is it based on distance or just randomly chosen? Um, well it is mostly based on distance every circuit is divided up into roughly three segments roughly equal segments but then they put the divider between the first and second segment for example they have to make sure that it doesn't fall kind of mid corner or right in the braking or the traction zone so they'll just adjust it slightly to make sure that perhaps it's at the end of a straight for example um, but it's more or less just breaking the circuit into three more or less equal sections. Uh, Harsha says hi Mark any idea why Liberty chose a new to be built street circuit in Vietnam over a permanent existing FIA grade one circuit in Thailand even though the latter has been racing, uh, has better racing history and audience. Is it all related to the money? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's a really short answer, but it is the answer. It is all related to the money. Every time there's a new entry into the Formula One calendar or a proposed entry, somebody wants to launch a new Grand Prix, it has to be funded. There are huge hosting fees, as we know, and that fee has to be paid by somebody. And typically in lots of places, as it is in Vietnam, it's being heavily funded by the government of that particular country. So they are willing to put up a huge sum of money to be able to host a Grand Prix in their, their country or their capital city or wherever it is, because it might bring some tourism, it might bring put them on the global map like no other sport can do. And that's why Formula One is still quite an attractive proposition despite what it costs. But it is all about the money. Right, two more. Wayne says, Hey Mark, uh, I was thinking about the dimpled surface of golf balls and the way they affect its flight path, etc. Could this principle be used on certain surfaces on an F1 car to make them more slippery and flat surface where the air needs to stick to the car? Now that's a really interesting question and one I've been asked loads of times. Some of you, if you remember watching my uh, show, my series on Discovery Channel that went out a couple of years ago, Driving Wild, one episode where we went to Thailand and raced long tail boats, um, I built a long tail boat 
and we actually used a golf ball dimpled surface coating on the underside and it works really really well. Why don't we use it on Formula 1 cars? Um, very quickly without going into too much complicated depth. Uh, the reason it works on a, on a golf ball is because a golf ball is spherical and in terms of as that golf ball is flying through the wall, uh, through the, uh, the, the air, what we're trying to do is minimise the turbulence coming off that golf ball and therefore the airflow detachment. So as the golf ball comes through the air, because it's just round, the airflow that's coming off the back of it is spiralling off in all sorts of directions. By putting those little dimples in the surface, it creates tiny little vortices all over the golf ball, little turbulent, tiny little turbulent areas. And what that does is it energises that boundary layer around the edge of the golf ball and keeps it attached to the golf ball for longer, delaying the separation, if you like, the airflow separation off the back of the golf ball as it goes through the air. With me? Now what that does is it makes it fly further. On a Formula One car, we're not really just trying to make the, the car faster in terms of our aerodynamics. What we're actually trying to do is we're trying to control the flow around the different surfaces of the car. So most or many of the aerodynamic surfaces on a Formula One car are actually less about outright downforce as they are about flow control and sending the airflow to the right places around the F1 car. So for that reason, we don't really want that little, that tiny little pockets of turbulence all the way along. We want it in certain places and we actually put things like vortex generators uh, in various places around an F1 car for a similar reason to energize that boundary layer, keep the airflow attached to various surfaces, but actually what it would do is increase the drag level and probably end up being detrimental or certainly wouldn't give us the benefit that we're looking for on a Formula One car um, that it gets, that it gives us on a golf ball. So it's been looked at on many occasions, probably by, by every Formula One team. Uh, also things like shark skin coatings. We've looked at all of those. We were looking at those when I was still at McLaren and actually it just, it just doesn't give us what we want with the, the speeds that an F1 car goes, the shape and the size of the bodywork. You know, we can control drag much more in terms of the shape of our aerodynamic pieces. Like a wing, for example, is a, a teardrop shape. And that does that thing that I just described with the golf ball in that it, it, it tapers off towards the rear, which minimizes the separation of the airflow and therefore minimizes drag. But we can do that by creating a different shape of wing. You can't do that with a golf ball because it has to be round, so they looked at other ways to try and come up with the same kind of solution. I hope that makes sense. Um, it's quite complicated, but as I say, it's, it's a good question and loads of people have asked it, and it works in some applications, but not, it's not beneficial in the grand scheme of things in a Formula One car. Uh, right, Tom Tang says, uh, if the 2021 F1 cars will be that easy to follow each other, as they claim, will drivers be able to pass much more easily in Singapore instead of deliberately slowing down? No. Uh, and the reason it's a no is that the 2021 regs and, and this idea of allowing cars to follow more closely, that's an aerodynamic gain. So, in you know, keep it very brief, but at the moment what we have is this problem where going round corners, when cars are within a certain distance of the car in front, the turbulent air coming off the lead car upsets the aerodynamics of the, of the trailing car so much that they lose all their downforce and it starts to slide off the road going round corners. Now, we're trying to address that in 2021, so that should be much improved and actually the amount of downforce that this car loses, the tests and, and simulations already show that that's greatly improved. So yes, going through corners, we should be able to follow more closely, but that's not the only barrier to overtaking, of course. Don't forget we've got circuits, and Singapore is a great, a great example of that, that are narrow. Uh, these cars, Formula One cars, are enormous. They're really big now, so just literally on a, on a, a spatial uh, front, there's just not very much space on those circuits to get two cars plus a bit of racing room. Uh, through any of the, of the corners. That's a circuit that doesn't have many overtaking opportunities anyway without any of those other problems. And so no, places like Singapore are probably not going to benefit very much from the 2021 regs, but there will be other circuits that absolutely should. Other circuits, I mean Russia for example, overtaking there was hampered because the final sector is all slow, tight, twisty stuff where you've got to get really close to the car, behind, uh, car in front 
to get that slingshot onto the main straight to then be in an overtaking situation. Whereas at the moment, the car behind has to fall back so much to maintain its downforce, by the time it gets onto the straight, it's nowhere near striking distance, even despite the fact it's a long straight with DRS. So potentially in 2021, that type of situation could be greatly improved. That's the idea anyway. So it will improve lots of different occasions for overtaking or at least give more opportunity for overtaking but probably not at places like Singapore or Monaco that kind of thing. Right I think that is all the questions that I have selected for this week so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, it's starting to absolutely hammer down. I hope the noise is okay because I've got a corrugated tin roof above me with rain hitting it very hard so I hope you can hear me. Um, and my coffee's gone cold. Oh my goodness what a nightmare. Anyway, thanks very much for your patience, thanks for watching, thanks for all the questions. I'll be back on Thursday with a Japanese Grand Prix preview and another giveaway of course from the gpbox.com. Looking forward to getting out onto the Xbox around Suzuka because it is an unbelievable track. But for now guys, thanks very much and I'll see you soon. Ta-da!